Well, it's good to be back. We've been looking at the first half of the book of Isaiah, which emphasizes the condemnation on the people of Judah for breaking the covenant and the announcement of the coming Assyrian crisis. So Isaiah had been preaching this, and now in chapters 36 and 37, we see the crisis came. And uh, so as we continue on our study, we're going to be looking at that crisis for a moment and then looking ahead to the announcement of the Babylonian captivity and the prophecies about the future. Now, there is a chronological issue here in chapters 36 and 30 through 39. And the actual chronology is, first of all, Hezekiah got sick, then he was visited by the Babylonians, and then Sennacherib's attack came. So chapter 38, he's, visit, he's, he's uh, got sick, uh, he uh, is healed, Isaiah brings this uh, healing to him, he's promised 15 more years, and promised deliverance from the Assyrians. Now that's really important, because he's promised deliverance from the Assyrians in chapter 38. And then following chapter 38, he's visited by the Babylonians, and he shows them everything that he has in his palace, and Isaiah comes along and announces the Babylonian captivity. And then we have the actual attack that fulfills the promise that was given uh, in uh, chapter 38, verse 6, that Jerusalem is going to be attacked, but will be delivered. And that's exactly what happens in chapters 36 and 37. Now you might wonder, well, why does Isaiah place the, <coughs> the event of chapter 36 <coughs> ahead of the illness in chapter 38. Excuse me a moment. Suddenly my throat got a little bit dry. <coughs> Why does Isaiah reverse the order? Well, Isaiah is more interested in the thematic order than the actual chronological order. <coughs> And so he, he follows a thematic order rather than the chronological order. <clears throat> but what happened? What happened is that there was the attack by Sennacherib in 701 BC, and he came down the coastal plain, <clears throat> made his way into the mountains, besieged Lachish, and then made his way on up to Jerusalem. And this was all in fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy. So this is what happened. <clears throat> he was besieging Jerusalem, and as a result, um, we see this image is portraying the king of Judah giving tribute to Assyria to make Assyria go away. <clears throat> Here Sennacherib is on his throne, and he's receiving submission from the elders of Judah. And this is actually engraved on the palace of Sennacherib in Nineveh. You can see these engravings in the British Museum in London. The siege itself must have looked something like this. This is the attack uh, by an Assyrian army on the city of Lachish, very similar to what would have happened in Jerusalem. <clears throat> Notice the ramp, the ramp going up to the wall so that the siege equipment can get on near the top of the wall and break through the top of the wall. So you see those siege engines uh, up against the wall. You also see the Assyrian archers, um, and uh, you can see on the right, you can see some people being taken off into captivity. You can see the defenders of the city up on the wall seeking to thwart the attack by the Assyrians. So this was the th siege of Lachish. And in the midst of this siege of Lachish, Rabshakeh sent this uh, threat against Hezekiah saying, uh, you better submit. And, uh, and, and pay tribute, and Hezekiah has rebelled against the king, and he doesn't want to do that. So what he does in chapter 37, <clears throat> oh, one, one more picture here, here's the actual siege ramp at Lachish. What you see on the left is Sennacherib's depiction of it. What you see on the right is one of my colleagues, Jan Verbruggen, standing up there on the Assyrian siege ramp at Lachish. So there you see the ancient portrait, and here you see the actual site of this siege, where the Assyrians came against Lachish and then sent this threatening letter up to Hezekiah in Jerusalem. What did Hezekiah do? Well, he took this letter before the Lord, and he prayed to the Lord. 
and he brought this uh, matter of concern before the Lord. I think the application for us here is that when we're in a difficult spot, we need to turn to the Lord. And that's exactly what Hezekiah did. He turned to the Lord and prayed, and God promised deliverance. And God did indeed turn back the Assyrians at Jerusalem. Even though Jerusalem was besieged, <clears throat> it was not captured. Hezekiah knew where to turn in a time of crisis, and he turned to the Lord. And he took that letter that Rabshakeh had delivered, and he laid it out before the Lord, and God announced that uh, he would turn back the Assyrians, and they would be destroyed, and it was all fulfilled. What do these chapters reveal about Isaiah? He's a true prophet. What he prophesied has been fulfilled. That's what chapters 36 and 37 are all about. God fulfills the prophecy, and uh, what he promised uh, actually took place. <clears throat> And then in chapter 38, we see that Hezekiah is ill, um, and he is given this uh, special uh, fig newton <laughs> that goes on his, on, his, uh, on his thigh, and he recovers. And uh, after he is in his recovery, he's visited by some Babylonian rulers. He welcomes Merodach Baladan, a Chaldean priest, uh, prince, these are the Babylonian rulers. He welcomes them to his palace <clears throat> and shows them everything he has. And after these visitors depart, Isaiah comes to his house, knock, 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 and says, I, Hezekiah, what did you show these, these Babylonians? And he says, I showed them everything. On that basis, Hezekiah is told of the coming Babylonian captivity. And the Babylonian captivity now serves as the background for chapters 40 through 66. Do you see why <clears throat> Isaiah put the uh, event here of the, of the sickness and the visit by the Babylonians after the Assyrian crisis? Because the visit by the Babylonians prepares the way for the next section of his book about the Babylonian captivity. So chapters 38 and 39 reveal the coming Babylonian captivity and prepare the way for Isaiah's announcement that Judah is going to be brought back from exile. God's going to raise up King Cyrus and bring the people back uh, from exile. So that's what these chapters accomplish in the study of the book of Isaiah. So we're back to our chart again. I keep repeating this uh, chart because you need to see where we're going now. Chapters 38 and 39 prepare the way for the next section of the book <clears throat> with the Babylonian uh, captivity as the background. The background for the announcement of the coming of Cyrus, whom God is going to raise up to deliver the Jews from Babylon. And then we see the promise of the coming of a servant who is the Messiah and the promise of future future for Israel. But it's at this point, as we come into chapters 40 through 66, that many critical scholars will say, hey, hold it now. There's something that has gone terribly wrong. The first half of this book was about condemnation. <clears throat> the second half of the book is about consolation. It couldn't have been written by the same author. You can't have one author talking about the condemnation of God's people and the next chapter talking about consolation and blessing for God's people. And so there are scholars who will say these parts of Isaiah cannot be written by the same person. And so they will advocate there are several different Isaiahs. An 8th century Isaiah <clears throat> who authors chapters 1 through 39. A 6th century Isaiah who authors chapters 40 through 55. And even a 5th century anonymous Isaiah or anonymous prophet who author, authors chapters 56 through 66. <clears throat> so how many Isaiahs do we really have? That's a, a debated issue. But what is the major objection raised against the unity and single authorship of the book? The major objection is prophecy. And if you don't believe in prophecy, then you end up with two or three Isaiahs. Because Isaiah lived in the Assyrian period, and he tells us in chapters 40 through 66 about the Babylonian period, half a century past the time when he lived. 
how could he, living in the Assyrian period, have known anything about Cyrus, who conquered Babylon and decreed the return of the Jews? And so people say this can't be the same Isaiah, it must be a different man who wrote this second section of the book. And then somebody else wrote the third section of the book. The major problem is predictive prophecy. And if you can't accept predictive prophecy, you end up with two or three different authors of the book. But my view is that if you believe in God who created the universe, and if you believe in God who could create life in Mary's womb apart from a human father, if you believe that Jesus could turn water into wine, then it wouldn't be a problem for God to reveal to Isaiah that there would be a coming deliverer by the name of Cyrus and give Isaiah the information about Cyrus to announce the coming deliverance from Babylon. I believe in the supernatural. And I, I believe God even before they happened. So I accept the single authorship of the book rather than uh, double or triple different authors. But now the major themes of this section. Major theme is that the people are in captivity because of their sins. God has taken in them to Babylon because of their sins. The captivity itself proves that Yahweh is God because he predicted it. The captivity was predicted by God. But God will redeem his people. He's going to redeem them through Cyrus and even name Cyrus as the, as the Persian ruler who's going to redeem his people. But the exciting thing is that there's even more. Not only is God going to redeem his people from Babylon through Cyrus, but he's going to do even more. He's going to redeem them spiritually through a coming servant. So in chapters 40 through 48, we see a promise of a new exodus. Israel had left Egypt back in 1446 BC, but now there's going to be a new exodus. There's going to be an exodus from Babylon. And they're going to be restored from Babylon and taken back to Jerusalem. And this all comes as a result of Cyrus' decree. So this is what is uh, happening here in chapters 40 through 48. And as we begin this second section of the book, we come to a classic uh, chapter. <clears throat> but as we, as we look at the conquest of Babylon, uh, Cyrus is actually named the one who will conquer uh, Babylon. He's named in chapter 45, verse 1. The Lord says to Cyrus, his anointed, who I'm taken by the hand to subdue nations. That would be Babylon. And to lose the loins of kings and open doors before him so that the gates will not be shut. God is going to use Cyrus, even names him, to decree the return of the Jews. He's going to conquer Babylon, allow the Jews to go back to their homeland. But now as we begin the second section of this book, we come to a chapter that is a classic text on the greatness of God. If you want to get to know God better, study chapter 40. It's a ch classic chapter on the greatness of God. You know, we've got some classic chapters on God in the Bible. There's Isaiah 40, there's John chapter 1, there's Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. These are some classic texts about God, and this is a classic text in the Hebrew Bible about God, chapter 40. So what is he telling us here in chapter 40? <clears throat> well, he's telling us that God, Israel's God, is greater than all. He's greater than earthly rulers. He's greater than pagan deities. He's greater than idols. He's greater than his creation. He's greater than all. And so throughout this chapter, he's emphasizing the greatness of God. <clears throat> and he is so great and so powerful, he's going to be able to raise up Cyrus to defeat uh, the, uh, the Babylonians and allow the Jews to return to their homeland. And so this is a chapter on the greatness of God, greater than his creation. He's greater than idols. He's greater than earthly rulers. He's greater than pagan deities. And then at the end of this chapter, we have this wonderful promise to the people in exile who feel that they're weary and tired and have been neglected by God. And uh, the Lord speaks and says, Though youths grow weary and are tired, and vigorous young men stumble badly, those who wait 
that is, trust, rely on the Lord, will gain new strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not get tired. Oh, I love that. I love the running verses in the Bible. And here's a, a, a promise that will run and not get tired. My son completed a 105-mile race around Mount Block this past summer. He got pretty tired, but the Lord sustained him, and he finished the race well. But I think he's talking really more about the spiritual life than the physical life here. They'll run. They'll run the race of life. And even though it's a, it's tiring, God will sustain them. They'll walk and not become weary. That's a wonderful promise. God imparts his unfailing strength to those who wait, that is, trust and rely upon him. Mount up with wings like eagles. Now in chapter 40 through 48, we focus on the promises concerning a servant. We looked at chapter 7, the promise of a coming Emmanuel. But here we see the promise of a coming servant. And the big question in this section is, who is the servant? There are four, four poems here that really introduce and describe the servant. Who is this servant of the Lord that is featured in these four songs? We call them songs because this section of Isaiah is poetry. <clears throat> Chapters 36 through 39 is historical narrative, but we're looking at poetry here. Isaiah was a great poet. And so in chapter 40, verse 2, Behold my servant. Who is this servant? My servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom my soul delights. I put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. He will not cry out or raise his voice nor make his voice heard in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, a dimly burning light wick. He will not extinguish. He will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not be disheartened or crushed until he has established justice on the earth. Who is this? Who is this servant of the Lord? One view is that it is a collective. It's uh, Israel, the servant, and sometimes the remnant of Israel a collective, either Israel or sometimes a remnant of Israel. Others say the servant is an individual. It's Isaiah, or perhaps Cyrus, or perhaps the Messiah himself. Others suggest that the servant can mean different things in different contexts, and sometimes the servant definitely refers to Israel. But out of Israel comes a remnant, and out of the remnant comes the Messiah. So we can see the synthetic view has the advantage of saying, yes, some texts talk about Israel as a servant. Some texts talk about a remnant of Israel, a small portion of Israel, a faithful group of Israelites that are serving the Lord. And the ultimate servant, the ultimate servant is the Messiah. Well, in your notes, I've given ten characteristics of the anonymous servant. And I think as we look at those ten characteristics, it will point us to the person of Jesus. As we look at the prophecies of what this servant is going to do, we see there's only one person that ultimately fulfills all of them, and that's Jesus. What are those characteristics? Well, he will affect a proper ordering of society, and Jesus will accomplish that. He will mediate a new covenant for Israel, affecting the salvation both of the people of Israel and the land of Israel. <laughs> that's Jesus. He will not become discouraged or lose confidence in Yahweh during his rejection. Isaiah prophesied the rejection of Jesus. He will learn submissively from Yahweh, as Jesus did, trusting and relying upon the Father. While rejected by Israel, he will bring salvation to the Gentiles. What a promise. That includes us. Blessing to us. He will suffer vicariously for the sins of Israel and the Gentiles. And Jesus died for our sins on the cross and the sins of Israel. He will suffer innocently, Isaiah 53.9. He will suffer silently, Isaiah 53.7. He will die during his sufferings and will be resurrected <clears throat> to an exalted position by the Lord. Finally, he will die with criminals but be buried with a rich man. So who can fulfill all of these prophecies? Yes, there are sometimes the remnant is Israel, sometimes the the, excuse me, sometimes the servant is Israel, sometimes the servant is Isaiah, but the ultimate servant, as we see in these prophecies and with the benefit of the New Testament, the ultimate servant is none other than Jesus. 
So who's the servant? He's the branch or the sprout that comes out of that house of David. We've seen this image before back in chapter 6. The promise that the holy seed is in the stump and that sprout that would spring forth from what looked like the end of the tribe of Judah was none other than the Messiah. He is that remnant seed that will come forth from the house of David and ultimately fulfill the messianic prophecies about him. <clears throat> there are four servant songs. The first one is in Isaiah 42, Behold my servant whom I have uphold. I put my spirit upon him. You think of the ministry of John and uh, when John baptized Jesus, the spirit of the Lord came upon him, empowering him for his, his ministry. And then in Isaiah 49, we have another song about the servant. And it says, um, the Lord called me from the womb, from the body of my mother. He named me. You think of the virgin birth. He has made my mouth like a sharp sword. He has prepared the servant's mouth for speaking. He said, Behold, you are my servant, Israel. Well, now how can this work? Well, the ultimate servant that came out of Israel is the Messiah. So here we see the idea of the collective, and out of that collective Israel comes the servant Messiah. He is the one who's going to be a light to the nations. Verse 6, I'll make you a light to the nations. And then we have the servant, the third servant song in Isaiah 50. The Lord has given me a tongue of disciples, a, a learned tongue, a trained tongue to speak. He says, I know how to sustain the weary with a word. Jesus used his words to comfort and encourage people. He says, the Lord opened my ear. I was not disappointed. I was not uh, disobedient. And he goes on to describe his relationship as a submissive servant uh, to the Lord. But the, the song that we want to focus on and the time that remains is Isaiah 53. This is the most well-known of the servant songs. And rather, try and rather than trying to look at each one of them, let's focus on chapter 53, the servant song that's most familiar. Now, evidence from the rabbinic literature indicates that early Jews applied this passage to the Messiah. The first century Targum of Jonathan ben Israel opens the, with this prophecy with the words, Behold my servant, the Messiah. A Targum is a commentary, an early Aramaic commentary on the Bible. And it says, Behold my servant, but it adds the words, the Messiah. And so here we find an early first century interpretation that says it's, it's the Messiah. Rashi interpreted the servant as Israel. Rashi lived in a medieval period, and he looked at what was happening to the people of Israel under the Crusades and the persecution they were going through. And he says, this is, this is not about the Messiah. This is about the suffering of Israel. Well, his opinion became authoritative in Judaism. And so when you talk to a Jew today about Isaiah 53, they'll say, well, that's Israel. I had a student who was Jewish in his background, and his rabbis told him that this was about Israel. He read this and read the New Testament and says, no, it seems to me it's about it's about um, Jesus, but uh, he finally came to believe and to trust in Jesus, but it wasn't due to the rabbis helping him along the way. The rabbis said, no, this is about Israel. But the authoritative opinion in Judaism today is this is about Israel. This is about Israel's experience of persecution under the uh, Spanish Inquisition, under the Nazi Holocaust. Well, let's take a look at this text, and it actually begins in Isaiah 52. 52 verse 13 is where this text begins. So let's, uh, let's examine it. 52 verse 13 begins, Behold, my servant will prosper. What an announcement. He's going to be successful. <laughs> he will ultimately be successful. And notice how it describes he will be high, lifted up and greatly exalted. Be high. The word means to rise. I think it's spoken. Uh, points to his resurrection. He will rise, be lifted up, his, his uh, ascension into heaven, and greatly exalted, exalted to the right hand of the Father. So here in verse 13 is the announcement that Jesus is going to be successful. He'll rise from the grave, he'll ascend to heaven, he'll be exalted to the right hand of God. 
with his work, work finished. Then he goes on in verse uh, 14 to talk about the humiliation of the Messiah. Just as many were astonished at you. Um, so his appearance was marred more than any man, his form more than the sons of men. Marred, physically beaten, and so badly beaten that people were astonished and looked up at him as he was being taken to the cross and just had to turn away. It was too much to bear. And then, thus he shall sprinkle many nations. The word sprinkle there is the very word in Leviticus to speak of, of cleansing. Now, Israel didn't cleanse the nations by their death or their sacrifice. Thus he, the Messiah, will cleanse. It's a, it's a cleansing, spiritual cleansing of the nations. Kings will shut their mouths on account of him. For what had not been told them, they will see, and what they had not heard, they will understand. These kings in the future will be astonished when they realize of his own sins, but because of theirs, what they had not heard, they will one day understand. We move on into chapter 53, and we see the servant's rejection by his people. Who has believed our message? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Now, these are the words of unbelieving Israel, as they, as they didn't believe in the in the Messiah and they didn't believe because he was so unattractive verse 2 he grew up before him like a tender shoot like a root out of parched ground there was no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him here's Israel explaining why they rejected him he didn't look like a king he didn't have the appearance of a king he, he wasn't born in Jerusalem he didn't have the the appearance the stately form uh, that would make him attractive. I think Jesus so identified with humanity that he appeared rather plain. Not a handsome, strong-looking guy, but a rather plain, kind of guy you would never think would, would be important or have royalty. He says, no, no appearance that we should be attracted to him. And then rejected, he was despised and forsaken by men, a man of sorrows acquainted with grief, and like one from whom men hide their face, he was despised, and we did not esteem him. And here we've got Israel speaking of how they rejected him. But now they're beginning to realize that what he did, he did for them. In verses 4 through 6, the servant suffering for sin. Surely our griefs he bore, our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. So here they're recognizing that Jesus suffered in their behalf. But during that suffering, they thought he was getting his just deserts from God, that he was getting what he deserved. In fact, he was bearing the consequence of the people's sin. He bore their sin, carried their sorrows. Verse uh, 5, he was pierced through for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities, the chastening for our well-being fell upon him. Notice we have substitution going on. Jesus took the place of sinners. He was pierced. He was crushed. He was chastened for them. This is penal substitutionary atonement. Three important words. It was punishment. It was substitutionary and accomplished atonement. Penal substitutionary atonement. And that's all captured in verse 5. <clears throat> Verse 6, I love the image here. We, all of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Sheep aren't prone to, to lining up and going in the right direction. They need to be led. They need to be directed. And he says, these, all of us, like sheep, have kind of wandered off on our own. Each has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us to fall on him. Again, we have the substitutionary idea in our atonement. God's divine wrath was directed onto the Son that we might receive forgiveness of sin and justification on the basis of faith. Substitutionary atonement, all seen there in verse 6. It goes on in verses 7 through 9 to talk about the servant's death. He submitted to death willingly. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, but he did not open his mouth. He didn't object. He didn't raise out a, raise a cry or make a fuss like a lamb that is led to slaughter, like sheep that is silent before its shears. He did not open his mouth. He didn't raise objections to the kangaroo court that they took him through. 
he accepted the judgment. He did not open his mouth. Verse 8 mentions the generation that oppressed him didn't realize um, the meaning of his death. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. His, his court, his trial was, uh, there were a number of violations of Jewish law. Uh, it says he was cut off from the land of the living for the transgression of my people. That generation failed to comprehend the meaning of his death and what he was doing for them. Verse 9, he suffered innocently. His grave was assigned with a wicked man, yet with a rich man in his death. Joseph of Arimathea provided a tomb for Jesus, a rich man. Because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. And there you see the innocence of Jesus. He is sinless. There wasn't anything that he had done to deserve the suffering that he went through. He suffered innocently. <clears throat> what happened as a result of his suffering? Verses 10 through 12. But the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief, if he would render himself as a guilt offering. He will see his offspring. He will prolong his days. Through his death, he would gain spiritual progeny. There would be offspring. There would be disciples that came as a result of his death. He will prolong his days, and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. An encouragement that there will be spiritual progeny and prosperity, blessing. Verse 11, as a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. By his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify many. Boy, that's the book of Romans. Justification by faith. Justification to all who believe. My servant will justify the many. Israel never justified the many. Jesus accomplished that through his death. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great. He will divide the booty with the strong, because he poured himself out to death. He was numbered with transgressors. No way that can be Israel. That's Jesus. He himself bore the sin of many and interceded for the transgressors. When has Israel interceded for the transgressors? He hasn't. When has Israel borne the sin of many? Israel hasn't. This is about Jesus. But because he did all of that, verse 12 tells us that he will be exalted. He will be allotted a portion with the great because he poured himself out to death. This is a powerful passage. It's a wonderful text. It's often preached at the time of Passion Week uh, and, and Resurrection. I, I do see both the death of Jesus and his passion here, but also his resurrection. The whole passage begins, he will prosper, he will rise and ascend and be exalted. So the message here is a message of good news. Well, if you've heard a message of salvation, uh, you need an invitation. And that's what we find in chapter 55. We go over to chapter 55, and here... After setting forth the message of salvation in these four servant songs, what do we have? Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. You have no money? Come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money, without cost. Are you thirsty? Love this little bird <laughs> getting a drink from this dripping faucet. And then this little boy, he's thirsty. So thirsty, he's just going to get the hose out. I remember when I worked in college for Eugene Sand and Gravel, it was a paving company, and I shoveled hot asphalt for about eight hours a day. They'd dump the asphalt on the street. I'd take my shovel, shovel it out into the area where it would be raked smooth, and then they would roll over and flatten it out. Standing in that hot asphalt all day, I was pretty much sweating all day, and I would get a hose like that boy, and I would just put it up to my mouth and just drink a half gallon of water at a time just to try to rehydrate myself. I know what it means to be thirsty. But this is a thirst that can only be quenched through Jesus. This is a thirst that can only be quenched spiritually. And so the invitation here, whoever thirsts, come and receive this gift. There's a cost, but the cost has already been paid. He says, without money and without cost, come and receive this gift, this wonderful gift, of salvation. Of course, Jesus picks up on this theme of, of, uh, of thirst and the provision of water in his uh, teaching. If you're thirsty, come to Jesus and drink and receive that wonderful gift of salvation.
The last section of the book, chapters 58 through 66, is a promise of peace. Isaiah predicts that there will be a peaceful and prosperous future for the people of Israel. Good days are coming for the people of Israel. And he promises that there will be a new heaven and new earth. And uh, this, this old heaven and this old earth is going to be purged, purified, and prepared for eternity. So Isaiah has, a, has in mind a future for the people of Israel. There are those that today who say, no, the church has replaced Israel. There isn't any future for Israel. Uh, that what God was going to do with Israel, now he's doing through and with the church. But I just don't see a biblical basis for that. Um, it seems like the promises that God gave his ethnic people, Israel, will by, be fulfilled by ethnic Israel as a believing people. I believe the purpose of the tribulation period that is described by the book of Revelation and mentioned by Jesus in the Olivet Discourse is specifically attended, intended to bring the people of Israel to their knees in repentance. And uh, at the end of that tribulation period, when they've suffered, then Jesus will return and he will welcome uh, the remnant of Israel to himself. And uh, they will be blessed and enter into the the blessings of the new covenant. So God does have a future for Israel. Paul writes in Romans 11 verse 26, one day all Israel, that is the remnant of Israel, the remnant that is present at the time of Jesus' return, will be saved. So that is a future for Israel as a people, Israel as ethnic Israel. <laughs> but then God promises a new heaven and new earth. He promises, he says, I will create a new heaven and new earth, the former things shall not be remembered nor come to mind. And this is a promise that one day, after Jesus rules and reigns for a thousand years, God is going to purge, purify, and prepare this earth for eternity. Where is heaven? Well, heaven is going to be here on this earth after it's been purged and prepared for eternity. The new Jerusalem, the place that Jesus has gone to prepare for us, is going to be placed on this earth. It will come down out of the heavens and onto this earth. And that's where believers are going to dwell in the New Jerusalem on this re refurbished and, and recreated new earth and will dwell there uh, forever. So Isaiah uh, gives us a, a great deal of prophecy about the person and work of Christ and about uh, the future for God's people Israel. And I think that's probably why, why they often refer to it as the gospel of Isaiah, the good news of Isaiah, because it really has the good news about Messiah and God and the future for God's people. I'm going to pray and conclude our time and then uh, uh, let you interact and discuss Isaiah in your, in your cohort groups. Lord, thank you so much for the time we spent together tonight reflecting on this great message from Isaiah, a message about the Messiah, a message about your plans for your people in the future. Lord, we embrace Jesus. We thank you for him. Thank you for all that he did in fulfillment of the prophecies of these servant songs. And I pray that you might just help these students as they interact tonight, discuss these things. And uh, Lord, we just thank you for this great message that we can share with others that uh, that Jesus, the Messiah, has come. He's died on the cross. He's paid the penalty for our sins. And there's a wonderful new day coming for all who embrace that gift of salvation. Thank you for the time we've had tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs>